to cover. Um, and if there's anything else that you're interested in that maybe we didn't talk about, um, we can, uh, you know, s shoot me an email and we can, we can go over that. The two topics are, <coughs> number one, serialization. And number two, deployment. In other words, you've written a great application. How do you get it to the rest of the world? And there's some options as far as that goes. And the options are sort of shifting, but at any rate, I don't want to steal my own thunder and talk about that before we're ready. So anyhow, the first thing we're going to talk about is serialization. And I don't know if we'll take all the class today or not. Um, if Depending on how it goes, I might be able to at least give an overview of deployment. What does serial mean? Spelled, and let me rephrase that before I, I keep getting people talk about Captain Crunch or whatever, but when you see things called serial, spelled that way, what does that mean? What's, what's a serial port versus a parallel port? What is a old time, before movies they would have serials, okay? Uh, I, I, I'm not old enough to remember that. I remember my dad telling me that, all right? So, so yeah, I'm not that old. But what does serial mean? Sequential, all right? In a line, in a sequence, in a series, if you will, all right? So, the idea of serialization is twofold. We want to be able to take an object that, where does the objects live? Objects live on the heap. All right? So, you know, we have student s equals new student. We do a bunch of stuff to it. Maybe we add classes to it, um, courses, that is, or all kinds of other stuff. When we do that, again, we create a pointer that points to where the student lives on the heap. So here's our student object. And this is probably a stupid question, but I don't mind asking stupid questions. What shape is that object? You were describing it. It's a rectangle right now, but is a rectangle really accurate? Because we could have in here, we could have an array list of courses that the student took. All right? We may have transcripts from other universities. We may have any number of standardized test scores like ACT, SAT, uh, the compass test, whatever those other tests are that they give here. There could be a whole bunch of stuff related to a student that kind of makes it not fit in that neat rectangle, but sort of makes it like a little hierarchy or a little tree or multiple trees or any number of different things. All right. We've already seen a couple examples of that. Pizza, uh, orders have pizzas on them. Students have courses. And it, it shouldn't take much imagination to uh, imagine it getting thornier than that. What if the courses had objects that belonged to it, had a department object that belonged to the course, or whatever? So, what does that mean? Well, that means that storing this can be a difficult thing. All right, because it's not simply like a spreadsheet where you're going to store like what we'd call a flat file where if we just had basic student information, first name, last name, we could output that to a flat file and everything would be okay. We want to store everything about the student, including the structure of courses that they belong to and so on and so on and so forth. Essentially what we want to do is we want to take this gigantic structure, whatever shape it is, and we want to put it up 
set to disk in just a plain old text file. Sort of a linear sort of thing. Sequence. Just a blob of code. All right? Another way to say that um, is we're kind of freeze drying the object. All right? Or dehydrating it. So we can dehydrate our object and turn it into a flat text file. And guess what we can do? We can rehydrate it. Just add water and it springs back to life. All right? Except we don't actually add, add water. So please don't, when you're doing this, like spill water on your keyboard thinking that that's going to get it to work or anything. I assume you already know that. Yeah. Not, not take me literally. Yeah, take, take me, yeah, exactly. Well, about some things. Like when I, when I say that like, you know, we're going to have a final on such and such day. That you probably should take literally. But that's not to be taken literally. So what we want to do is we want to go and we want to have a way of taking and outputting that object So for, for two big reasons. Number one is so that we can save an object and later restore it, bring it back. A second thing we would want to do, maybe, would be to transfer this object over a network to something else, to some other application or some other application, some other component, some other resource. So in doing all this, we want an easy way to take and sort of flatten out and make it into a serial string of, of bytes file that we could just send down a network just like we were sending a plain old text file. So, the process of serialization is this, is being able to take an object that could have all crazy structures in it and boil it down, dehydrate it, whatever you want to say, into just a plain old flat text file that you can then transmit to another network, another service, whatever, or you can deserialize it and bring it back in and create the object. <coughs> Pardon me? Save and load. Exactly. Exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at an example that does the serialization. All right? And as you can imagine, this is not, how do I want to put this? This is not a problem that one person is going to face. Everyone is going to have this kind of problem. All right? So the question would become, um, you know, there should be something in the language or in the framework that allows for it. And there is. And that's what serialization is. Now, there is something that I've not gotten involved with too much, and I'm not 100% sure. Let's do a quick Google to see if this uses serialization or not. And that is object-oriented databases. You know what is amazing? Object permanence. That's the first thing on the list. It's like Google knew what I was talking about. Because what we want to do is we want to save an object. We want to make it permanent. So object-oriented database serialization. In computer science, serialization, translating structures into a format that can be stored for later use, blah, blah, blah. Deserialization, also called unmarshalling. That's a new one that I've heard. You could then go take and store this in a database. All right. Is there any one kind of object that you think we would benefit from being able to store? Is that the only one? No. Yeah, just about any object we would probably benefit from being able to store. All right. So what does that mean? 
How does this fit in the inheritance structure then? The ability to serialize it. How would that fit into the inheritance structure, do you think? Well, we got two choices, right? What are the two choices as far as our OO design? Or, okay, let me, let me clarify my questions. The people, that, the people that wrote Java decided to add serialization to it. All right? They decided that whenever they decided that. They could have decided it, they could have implemented it a couple different ways. One way they could have implemented it is, since we might want every object to do this, we could put that code to serialize in an ancestor object. Like we could put that code just in the basic object. All right? What's our if we don't inherit, what can we do? What's the what's the thing that we talked about that isn't inheritance, but it's similar to inheritance in some respects? The interface. Right. So now there would be all kinds of baggage if we put the serializing code in the, um, in the, um, what I'm going to say, in the um, framework itself, if, if we uh, put that in the, in the super class. So we don't necessarily, even though we might want the ability to, to store any object, we want the ability to pick and choose what we're going to store. All right. So therefore, it really wouldn't make sense to put it in the ancestor object because that would be having a lot of uh, overhead around. All right. That would be having a lot of overhead around um, in the objects. So we'd be saving stuff, or we would have the ability to save everything, but we might not want to store, uh, uh, be able to save everything. We might want to pick and choose what we can save. So therefore, the logical conclusion that they came to is make it an interface. So we can create a interface that anyone that you want to serialize, and by anyone I mean any class that you want to serialize, will implement that interface. And then you'll be able to call methods to hydrate and de or dehydrate and hydrate the object, or serialize it and deserialize it. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see the, uh, implementing a serializable class. So let me go download the example. All right, I posted a folder or a zip file that contains a bunch of examples, one of them being the serializable one. All right, so let's look at serialization. I have two files here. I have information that you could put about a person, like, you know, um, like your phone, you can put who the owner of the phone is and that sort of thing in, you know. And then I have a GUI that goes along with it. Which one of these do you think I'd be more apt to want to serialize? A person. Why the person and not the GUI? Yeah the, yeah, the GUI is just the GUI. It's just an interface, right? I might want to access this person from a variety of different places, right? Not just one interface. So the person is the guy that I want to serialize. 
And again, if you ever get something like that, you can open it with WordPad or Notepad++. We don't have Notepad++, but we do have WordPad. I'm not going to drag it over. I almost did that, right? But that doesn't work. I'm catching on. Yeah. And then I can just save it. And I'll do the same thing with the GUI when we look at it. All right, now I can go in and edit this guy, and it shows me. All right. First thing we notice is that it, the class person implements serializable. So what does that mean? When we say it implements it, it means it must honor the contract. In this case, we have a very simple person class that simply has a name, an email address, and a phone number. We have get and set methods for those. Nothing terribly exciting. Looky here. This is a real easy interface to handle, right? Because I sure don't see anything that looks like it relates to something other than this class itself. So there are no methods in serializable, oddly enough. All right. All these methods are just plain old methods that I would have, getter and setters for all my attributes. I implement serializable. Now, how do we use it? Well, let's run this and see. Let's run this first and then we will take a look at the code in the GUI that does this. So, All right. Notice that I have two Java files, Java uh, for person and person GUI.java. I, however, have class files. All right. I have a person GUI.class, I have a person.class, but then I have person GUI dollar sign clear, dollar sign retrieve, dollar sign save. What do you suppose those are? I mean, in, they do contain code relating to serialization, but that's not why they're there. Go ahead. Okay. What are classes, what, what kind of classes, if you had to describe these, would these be? It rhymes with winner class. An inner class. All right, very good. Those are inner classes. Wherever you see a class name, dollar sign, and then something after it, like notice that person GUI.java is the name of the Java file. We compile it and get person.gui.class. 
We also get person GUI dollar sign clear, person GUI dollar sign retrieve, person GUI dollar sign save. What that means, just visually we can determine, those are the inner classes, all right, for person GUI. Now what do you suppose those classes do? Of course they do the saving and the retreating and the clearing, but what are those classes do you think tied to? What kind of classes are they? What's it rhyme? It rhymes with, it rhymes with mutton. Well, come on, how many words rhyme with mutton? But, right, exactly. So these are the action listeners for the buttons on this GUI. All right. So in other words, remember we talked about there being a few different ways that we could define an action listener. We could have the GUI itself implement action listener and then use this. All right. People asked in class, I think, what this means. You know, think of it as, as, as like the pronoun me. What does me mean? Well, it depends who's speaking. Me or I mean whoever is speaking, that's, the, that's who me or I is in that sentence. Well, when you say this, it means whatever class is, quote, speaking. All right, so those are the event handlers, all right, for the person GUI. So when we look at this, I bet we have a GUI that has three buttons on it. Let's see if I'm right. I, I'm asking this like, like this is the first time I've ever seen it. You know, and, and, you know, and, and uh, not that I've written it. Like, I wonder if there really will be three buttons on this. And we look, and sure enough, there are three buttons on this. A save, a clear, and a retrieve. So, I can go, Mike. Enter my email. And enter my phone number. And I can click save. All right. So I click save. I click clear. Everything's gone. Nothing up my sleeves. I click retrieve, and there it is. Now, lest you think I'm doing some sort of trick here, I can close it, run it again, and click retrieve, and it comes up again. All right? Well, where does it put it? If we look, it puts it in an SER file. All right? SER is sort of a standard extension that you can use for a serialized class. So we'll see where we define the name of it in a second. We don't have to call it .ser or person or whatever. We could, we could call it something else. Now if we were to look at this file, I said, if we were going to look at this file, I'm going to open it up in Notepad. And it appears to be using Chinese characters. All right. Why is that? Well, this is a freeze-dried version. All right, it encodes it based on however it feels like encoding it, and it saves it. Yes? <laughs> That's a darn good question. I, I don't know. It, it, it very well could. Uh, yeah, well, that, that was a great question. I, don't, that, I think that's going to be on the final. Uh, all right. The point is, is it doesn't store it in any intelligible way. All right. Um, this is a very compressed format and it stores everything related to it. Now, let's actually look at the code and how we do all this magic. So we've seen the person class. 
And a person class is about as boring as you can get. Three string attributes. We have a constructor to set all three attributes. We have a set name, set email, set phone, get name, get email, get phone, and that's it. All constructors, setters, and getters. So nothing at all fancy in here. Now, when we look at the GUI, I did that one. When we do the GUI, you'll notice that this will be nice because this will be a nice little GUI review too, by the way. All right. I have a border layout. What does a border layout mean? you guys, but go ahead. Uh, kind of. I, I, yeah, I, I believe so, although this one actually has a box layout inside the the um, the um, border layout. Okay. Well, like this? Okay, we'll just look at this example. What this is, is this is a bunch of little J panels. All right, we'll, we'll analyze this. Let, let's, first, let's first go in and look at the serializable part. Then we'll go back and look at the GUI part. All right. I set my three listeners to new save, new clear, and new retrieve. Whereas save, retrieve, and clear are things that implement the action listener interface. So these are my three in our classes. All right. Clear does what? Just clears out those text fields. No big deal. Save does what? Save creates a new person object, gives it the value of the name, email, and phone, creates an output stream. All right. What's an output stream? Again, stream and serializing sort of go hand in hand, right? Because if you think of serializing in a line, the stream is, is giving out order sort of in a sequential linear way. So I'm outputting a stream, stream of characters, and I have within a try catch new file name or new file output stream and I give the file name. That's how it got to be called person.ser. Out equals new object output stream f out and then I write to the file stream, or the output stream, the object P, all right, which is a person. Why am I allowed to do this? Why am I allowed to say output P, which is a person? 
Pardon me? It is generic. What kind of argument do you think this method takes? It takes an object, but what kind of object? A serializable object, exactly. So if you remember, in the person class, we implemented serializable, but we didn't put any methods in there. And you might wonder, like, well, what's, what gives with that? All right? You know, why, um, you know, what's the point of implementing an interface if you're not adding any methods? Well, the point of that is the whole polymorphism thing. That we can call this right object method on any object that implements serializable. So that's all you have to do to make it serializable is to implement the serializable interface, open your stream, and write to it. Why do we have a try-catch here? Yeah, because you're doing something that's outside of the program's control. What could, for example, go wrong trying to create this file and writing to it? Disk space could be out. Um, the, the user that is running this might not have sufficient permissions to write to this directory. All right? uh, any number of things along those lines could happen. So again, this is something that's out of our control. We're asking the file system to create a file and output to it. I don't know if that's okay, so therefore I'm going to wrap it in a try-catch. Right? There's no way my program could know if it's okay or not. So we just got to try it, and if there's an error, we catch the error. All right? Now, retrieving. Retrieving is the opposite. All right? We're going to almost to the point of wherever you see output in the one above, put input. All right. Instead of a file output stream, we got a file input stream. Instead of an object output stream, we have a object input stream. We read instead of write. And this is the process that rehydrates that object. All right. It says, take this file, read it in, and transform it into the person object. All right. So now our person object P contains the stuff from that serialized file. So this is the dehydrating of taking our object and turning it into a, just a flat sequential file, this is our rehydrating of deserializing it, taking the contents of that file and turning it back into a person object. And then we can set the different text boxes on the screen. Yes? Well, how does that drop down get populated? Yeah. You, you, you could. You could, or uh, again, um, you, you, you know, you're, you're kind of taking this, you're kind of taking and going with this out of context um, because the question would be is like, how is that formed? Are, are those a list of my employees or what? All right. Um, keep in mind, I'm calling this file person.ser because I only got one of them. I could actually create a file. I could actually create something where I had an ID number that looked up a person. And in which case, the file name wouldn't be person.ser. It would be their employee number.ser. And so I could retrieve all the people that way. So one way I could do it is if I, if I had a list of people and each one of them had a serializable object. I could run out, get a directory listing, use those to create those objects, and then populate the dropdown. All right. 
let's look at the layout. Because Where did I see that? Oh, border layout. This probably isn't needed. Or is it? I don't know. That import. It doesn't hurt anything. That's what was confusing me. Okay, let's look at this layout. All right? If you don't declare a layout for something, what layout do you get? You get horizontal going across. So, if I don't declare any layout at all, what do I get? I get, I would get enter name. If I didn't, if I didn't have any layout going on at all, I'd get enter name, enter email, enter phone, then the three buttons. That's what I get if I did not have any layout at all. All right. What do we have instead? We have a box layout along the y axis. What does that mean? That means our stuff to be oriented this way. This actually is a box layout with along the x axis. All right. Which is the default layout. Right, but there's more. Ooh, but wait, there's more. Because if you thought about this carefully, you would say, wait a minute. Why isn't it like this? Well, that's what the box layout with a along the y-axis would seem to suggest it should be. Stacked vertically. The reason it isn't is because I don't put these controls directly in my box layout. I put each one of them in their own little mini panel. All right. I have P1 through P4. I have. My main panel is called P. It is a box layout that's oriented vertically. So as I put things on here, they're going to be arranged that way. But the thing is, is I'm not putting the individual controls on. I'm putting little mini panels. So little mini panel 1, P1, can, I'll put in that. And again, I haven't defined a layout for that. So what layout is it? Box layout, horizontally oriented. So what do I put in P1? I put enter name and then the text box. What's in P2? Enter email and the text box. P3, enter phone and the text box. P4, the three buttons. So I create my three mini panels. I don't give them a layout so they're oriented horizontally. I then add to my main layout not each one of these controls individually but the panel. So P1 gets stacked here. P2 gets stacked here. P3 and P4. And oh yeah, what's in P1? Well, 
Enter name, text box. Enter email, and text. Enter phone, text, button, button, button. So let's look at the code. All right. I have three panels. I'm sorry, four panels, P1 through 4, plus my main panel. I then add to the first panel, the first label and text, second panel, second label and text, third panel, third label and text, fourth panel, the three buttons. Because I've not specified a layout for those, they're oriented horizontally. So they'll be next to each other. The text will be next to the um, text will be next to uh, the label will be next to the text box. Alright. I then set my action listeners so that each button is tied to the right action that I want it to perform. I then set the layout for the main panel to be box layout along the y-axis. So that means that it's going to be sequential, but it's going to be stacked vertically. I then add each little mini panel to that. Those mini panels, each which contain a text and a, lab uh, or a, a label and a text box, except for the last one, which contains three boxes. Those get added to the main panel. I set the main panel of my window to the big panel, P, and then I make it happen and display it. So the key to doing intricate layouts and to get more flexibility of it is to keep in mind that, yeah, it's true that you want to do something more involved than that, but if you nest things together, you can achieve it. It's almost like HTML in that regard, where you're nesting stuff inside other stuff to make it work that way. And again, the two big layouts that we've seen, we've seen the horizontal box, the vertical box, and then we saw the border layout, which has the north, south, east, west, and middle, or center, whatever it's called. So you could do it that way as well, um, if you needed it. And each panel then you can decide a layout on, so you could mix and match if you wanted, you know. I'm trying to think of a case here. If I wanted these buttons, stack vertically, I would just set the layout of this panel to being a box layout along the y-axis, and that would stack these vertically. If I wanted to have it work like this, What would I do? Well, I'd make the main layout be horizontal, be a box layout that's horizontal, and I'd make the layout of each of the little mini ones be along the y-axis, so those would stack vertically. All right? So we, we're not going to cover creating a GUI in great detail as far as getting the layout and, and, and things along those lines, but you do have more, when you consider nesting, you do have more control than you may think. For example, I could make one of these panels, like maybe for the button, I could make it a border layout and have the one button in the north, the one button in the west, the one button in the east. I don't know why I do that, but you could. All right. Maybe if you want to have an arrangement of four buttons, that would make more sense to, to do it like that. But I can make each one of those little mini layouts have its own layout, um, or little mini panels have its own layout, and then I can arrange stuff within that panel and then put it within the layout of the bigger panel. All right, so serialization is really not that big of a deal.
All right. In a nutshell, you define the class as being serializable, as implementing serializable. You don't even need to, don't even need to implement any methods. Just declare it as implementing serializable. And then it can be used in these methods. to output an object and to read in an object. Notice again, we cast it because this read object is going to return an object, but we have inside information. We know that that's a person object. Therefore, we can cast it to a person object without any problem. Yes? Yes. Um, that file format is written um, to serve the purpose of serialization. It's not going to be very well suited to any other purpose. If you wanted to, for example, output something that you could bring into Word or bring into um, uh, Excel or whatever, or a comma delimited file that you, that you import into Excel or, or whatever, that's not serialization, all right? That would be that would be you would write your own sort of routine to go and do that, all right? To to probably output some sort of XML file, all right? But yeah, this this is is just like asking like, could you look at the dot class file? You could, but keep in mind that's the bytecode that the compiler creates that the Java virtual machine uses. So it's in a machine readable form. It's not particularly in a human readable form. Just the way that it stores the data. So no. Uh, the, the, to kind of answer your question, no. Are there programs that allow you to do that? Uh, maybe. You know, essentially they would do this. You know, they would they would deserialize the object and display the fields from from that. All right, but not not something straightforward of that, uh, like like you described. That would be something other than serialization. Other questions. Now, there's some issues with serialization, like for example. Well, it, I'm thinking more of if you change the definition of an object, that could be uh, a problem. That could be problematic. Uh, another thing is that um, if you were to serialize a GUI, that doesn't really work. That fails for some platform specific GUI elements. In other words, Java is multi-platform. Some of the elements are rendered a different way depending on if you're on a Mac or, or Linux or whatever. So some UI components are device dependent and as such aren't going to serialize very well. All right. I mean, there's more and you can read the book. There's more like disclaimers as far as serialization goes. But in a nutshell, that's it. All right. Next Monday, we will start in on deployment of our applications. Um, I can talk about it if that's one of the special topics you, you can talk about. It's really not that big a deal. Essentially, you register and you upload your APK. You have to give some ratings to your application, like if it is you know, um, for teens only or for anyone or for adults or whatever. You um, have to supply screenshots, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you generate a key um, to indicate that it's from you as the publisher. But, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty mechanical process. It's nothing, um, nothing earth-shattering. Nothing compared to the ordeal of 
of yeah uploading to the Apple iPhone iStore whatever that's called 